Guess what, Lions? For as little as $5 a month, you can get access to exclusive bonus audio content and help this program grow by joining the Lions of Liberty Pride. To learn more, head over to lionsofliberty.com slash support. Welcome to Felony Friday, a presentation of the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here is your host, John Odermatt. Felons, friends, and freedom lovers, welcome back to another edition of Felony Friday, the 100th episode of Felony Friday, right here on the Lions of Liberty podcast. Felony Friday, of course, is a show that I bring you each and every single Friday where I focus on exposing injustice in this nation's broken criminal justice system. And it has been quite a ride to episode 100. I can't believe we're here. I want to thank all of our loyal listeners here on Lines of Liberty for supporting the show. I honestly could not have done it without your guys' support. Otherwise, I'm just here speaking into a microphone. It's great to know there's people on the other side that appreciate this content, guys. And the content we have here is not just Felony Friday. As our longtime listeners know, we also have a Monday show hosted by Mark Clare, where he interviews leading minds in the liberty movement, hosts the once-a-month roundtable discussion. And every Wednesday, we have Electric Liberty Land, hosted by Brian McWilliams, your weekly shot of culture comedy, and liberty, and you can get all three of those shows in your little listening device in your ear by subscribing on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever the heck it is you get your podcasts. And I cannot wait to talk about this show, to start this show, to introduce my guests. And my guests today, I brought on three former cops. I'm going to introduce them later in a minute, but I do want to say that this show was actually recorded live it was well of course it was recorded live it was streamed live at the time it was recorded on one of my guests facebook channels dominic Izzo. he's a former cop out of cook county he's actually running for cook county sheriff in illinois and he has a massive following and he shared our live broadcast of this on his facebook show and I kind of kept that a secret, except for our Lions Pride group, who I uh, told about that. So some people have already heard this episode, and uh, people in the Pride have. Of course, you can join the Pride by going to lionsofliberty.com slash support. My other two guests on this show, Michael Wood Jr., he's been on the show previously, and Rayford Davis has also been on Felony Friday previously. I'll give them a full introduction in just a minute, but first, I want to tell you about health Excellence Plus, it is an incredible free market alternative to your standard corporate health insurance. You can find out more about Health Excellence Plus at lionsofliberty.com slash health. And just one more note, one more very, very important note before we start the show here. I want you guys to go to the Donor C app and I want to ask you to help out one of our best supporters we have here at Lions of Liberty, longtime member of the Lions of Liberty. Lines of Liberty Pride. He joined at $25. He's in our elite, our Lions Guard uh, segment of the Lions Pride. Daniel Lee, him and his family have suffered greatly from the flooding in Houston. A lot of damage in his house and his family's in uh, his mother's house and his, uh, his cousin's house, I believe. And there's a project on Donor C. The last house they're still really working on is uh, his, his family member. I believe it's his cousin. And Really, we would like to get that funded. There's like $1,800 left to get that funded. They would love to be back in their house before Christmas. So please, if you have any spare change, spare spare dollar bills, spare 10s, 20s, 50s laying around, please shoot that over to Donor C. I will link to it on the show notes page. And the show notes page can be found at lionsofliberty.com slash FF100 with links and notes to everything that we're going to talk about today. Today's show, we have three guests, three former cops. All, I think I can safely say all three of you are in favor of extreme reforms to policing and really to the criminal justice system as a whole. But I think it's also safe to say that you kind of come at that from different perspectives. I think you all have different ideological views, and I, I think that's healthy. I think I guess the goal here today is to find the the overlap, the areas of agreement. Of course, we're going to have some disagreement, and that'll be fine. We'll just uh, 
you know, be professional and, and work through those. But I think the, the goal here is to find areas where we can agree and highlight that. There's so much divisiveness and so much, uh, so much talk today that Republicans can't get along with Democrats and Libertarians can't get along with anybody. Uh, and it, it is possible to, to agree on, on some of these things. So that is the, uh, the goal of today's show. So I want to start out first by introducing Dominic Izzo, since you're hosting the live stream here. We'll introduce you first. You're a 16-year veteran police officer, and you gained, first gained notoriety, at least to me, uh, from your videos that you often recorded in your car, exposing police corruption, inefficiency, and eventually calling for your police chief's resignation. And ultimately, that led to your termination, and now right. you're running for sheriff in Cook County, Illinois. So... Welcome back to Felony Friday, Dominic. Thanks. Good to talk to you again. The last one we talked was uh, April. Yeah, it's know. time. Time flies, man. Time definitely flies. And is is it safe to say that you would categorize yourself as a as a conservative? Is that your your viewpoint? You know what? Through this whole process running for sheriff, I'm going to tell you that my views are are being fortified in what I am. I would say conservative, and I always lean towards more Republican. Um, and I don't want to get off the rails as far as going my political views or whatnot, but I, I didn't see it back then speaking to you, but the more I got entrenched in this, uh, political process, the more I see that both the Republicans and the Democrats are, are absolutely two heads of the same snakes. And I lean libertarian massively. Uh, I didn't know it until I started paying attention to it, but, uh, yeah, I would, you say, uh, conservative, uh, libertarian. Okay. That's good to know. Well, maybe we'll dig more into that a little bit later. Next, I want to introduce... Michael Wood Jr. Michael is a former Marine Corps vet, a retired Baltimore police police sergeant. He gained notoriety by exposing uh, instances of police brutality that he witnessed during his 11 years working with the Baltimore PD. Of course, he's been all over the podcast world. He's been on Joe Rogan. He's been on, I think, Joe Rogan twice. He's been on Part of the Problem with Dave Smith. He appeared on Felony Friday, of course, back on episode Forty, and I think he was also interviewed by uh, my colleague here at Lions of Liberty, uh, Mark Clare, as well. So, welcome back to Felony Friday, Michael. Thanks for having me back. It's definitely uh, I have to agree with Dominic right away that we kind of find a, a more home in the uh, libertarian side of ideology the more that we see uh, the realities of two party systems. Man, I was not expecting this. I thought you guys were going to cut out. I, I, I kind of was expecting this. I know that you all have your, your libertarian leanings, but um, yeah, that, that is interesting. But I mean, do you have a little bit, do you come at it more from a progressive standpoint on some, on some topics? Well, fundamentally, if so, everyone can know right from the beginning, I shed these labels. Uh, um, I, mean, I definitely would fall under the postmodernist kind of ideology of separating social constructs from objective reality. So I think all of these things are divisions to get us to fight one another. And we actually all have the same underlying desires. That's, that's a great point. Um, I think it can be used, though, because I, I think other people do have labels on each of you, whether you like it or not libertarian, progressive, conservative. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's important to to talk about that maybe you are labeled this way as a way, instead of to divide, to to unite, to unite around some of these things we're going to talk about today. So that, that's a great point, Michael. And we have Rayford Davis. He is back on the show as well. He was on Felony Friday back in episode number 71. Uh, Rayford, and he was also interviewed uh, by Mark Clare way back on episode 73 of Mark's show. Rayford served the city of North Charleston Police Department for six years. That was four years as a, as a patrol officer and two as a special victims unit detective. And during that time he was serving, North Charleston was the eighth most dangerous city in America. So he was dealing with some difficult situations. Um, and prior to becoming a police officer, Rayford served in the U.S. Coast Guard. Since then, Rayford has been an, an outspoken critic of uh, of policing today much like uh, much like michael and dominic so rayford I, I think it's i think it's safe to say that that you're a libertarian is that is that accurate uh well hey how about this if, if i i said well i, I kind of start off as a compassionate conservative libertarian but i'll have to disagree with the guys i've gone beyond that and i you know consider myself like a anarchist or a voluntarist uh how about how about that Ooh. So <laughs> those are scary words. Anarchy. So, yeah. So um, and 
uh, you know, I first uh, one of my first uh, podcasts I did was with Mark Claire a couple of years ago when I first kind of came out to, to speak out about a lot of these policing issues. Uh, so I appreciate you giving me that that opportunity. Uh, it's not easy to 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 speak out, and you know, Dominic is his his little videos that he does as a you know serving police officer. You know, I got to tell people just you know how how tough that is uh, for somebody to come out and speak out, and then. Uh, uh, Michael Woods, Joe Rogan video. If, if you got to see, people have to see that video uh, to you know to really get a, a good idea of of some of the issues that uh, policing face. Have you guys met each other before? Have, have you talked prior to this? No, no. I'd seen Michael's stuff, and uh, other than that, no. I'd, uh, I personally, I kept the I kept to myself within uh, uh, law enforcement as far as social media personalities. That's interesting. Uh, Rayford and I go back at least a couple years. Okay. Well, you guys were both, I don't know if you're, if you're still currently uh, members, but members of Leap, is that right? Yes, I'm still Rayford a member. is, I'm not. <laughs> I'm still a member of Leap. Yeah, I know there's been some evolution with that name change and, and all that stuff, but we, we, don't have to, we don't have to go down that road. Right. right. Um, all right, so let's, let's start off. We're talking about Leap. Let's start off talking about the drug war, and let's just dive right into it. We'll, we'll start with Dominic. What's your view on marijuana? Do you think marijuana should be fully legalized and or decriminalized? So I'll go with the decriminalized aspect first, because anytime somebody asks me about the legalization um, side of it, you know, I, I default to I don't have a background in chemistry or medicine. So when it comes down, down to long term effects, um, I don't want to give an answer by saying, oh, legalizing it. Uh, I've spoken to people that I'm friends with in the DEA, and they've talked about studies that they've done that says, you know, within the next 20 years, if you legalize it, it's going to have effect X, Y, and Z negatively on our economy. And that's that's about as paraphrasing as I can get it. Um, but when it comes out from a law enforcement standpoint, if you're talking about, you know, the, uh, the, the usage and whatnot, and you have to understand something, I was a big weed arrester. Um, I am absolutely 100% for decriminalizing it. I believe that law enforcement should play no role whatsoever in this plant. I've never done it, never tried it. I can't stand the smell of it, but it's a natural organic plant. Uh, and you know what? I, I honestly don't see any good in today's uh, today's society that we're we're citing and we're arresting and we're fining people for something they're consuming. It, it just it, it's insanity to me. It's absolutely insanity. What are your thoughts on that, Michael? Uh, I mean, I, I guess it's probably my thoughts on this are probably one of the leading things that I'm I'm known about. And I'm going to criticize you right away. What is marijuana, John? What is marijuana? Do not say that word. It is cannabis. Marijuana is like all this framing. There you go. I didn't reason. even. That's, 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 that's a good point. That's a good know. point. <laughs> I, I have no like, idea that it's not marijuana. No idea. So all of the framing that we have around the drugs issue kind of like it having trapped us into this answer. But we have to understand that drugs are a public health issue. And we've even like use this weird social thing to say what are drugs and what aren't. Look, water is a drug. A drug is something that affects the chemistry operation of your body. Water is a drug and more people overdose from marijuana this year. I mean, more people overdose from water this year than will ever dose from overdose from cannabis in history and going forward into the future like so it's the least dangerous substance we actually know of on this planet to human beings and we have decided in absolute tyranny that we will use the entire force of the government whether it's local or it's federal to enact an all-out war on one human being who is relatively resourceless because we are trying to dictate their individual actions that do not harm anybody else i mean that is textbooks tyranny textbook and we want to avoid decriminalization i'll make my case for because decriminalization maintains the black market and that is what we're trying to stop. As police officers, we are trying to stop violence and protect other people from violence. If you decriminalize, what that does is that ends up allowing little rich white kids in Massachusetts to go to a doctor and avoid prosecution. But yet everywhere else where we see discrimin discrimination and uh, occupying police departments, we will end up seeing the exact same black market and violence maintain its position. It's, it's, it's actually quite dangerous. And we do know what happens in a legalized market. There's plenty of examples around the world, including America, in which you could order ha heroin out of the Montgomery Ward calendar less than 100 years ago. 
Just just to ask you about that legalized versus decriminalized aspect of it. I mean, legalizing it isn't going to get rid of the black market altogether. It kind of depends on how it's legalized and what the government control is. I mean, something when we look at like liquor, right? Liquor, obviously legalized. You, you can buy it everywhere. It's more difficult to make, I think, than, than marijuana. You can you can just grow a marijuana plants. So that, I think, stops people from competing in the liquor black market. But, I mean, wouldn't there still be a uh, black market in a legalized market, especially if the government comes in and puts exorbitant taxes on it? If they regulate it, you have to look at what, how you're going to wind up selling it. If somebody makes wine or somebody makes uh, beer or you know, out of their out of their basements, you have all these mom and pop, uh, you know, IPAs and 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 you know, back uh, you know, brand um, wine. You know, what happens then? How is that? Is that going to be how the government's going to come in and say, "Oh, well, now you're you're operating in a legal business on something we regulated"? So I don't know if that's going to cause a problem too. Thoughts on that, Rayford? Yeah, yeah, I, I hate getting into that. You know, legalization, decriminalization, kind of semantics. Any issues uh, with – we're talking adult consensual activity, uh, use and trade uh, amongst themselves. Uh, none of that should be a concern of law enforcement. Uh, if someone uh, is – what you know, whatever is, is – harms another person, then law enforcement can be involved. If someone is a, an, an imminent threat or danger to other people in a public area, you know, if you talk about like DUIs or – or even child endangerment, then law enforcement can be involved. But otherwise, uh, you know, what regulation do you need for for marijuana? It's you know, it, it's pretty much none. And if you know, if you legalize it or decriminalize it, whatever you want to call it, uh, that would end two thirds of the drug war right there. Sixty five percent of people who use illegal drugs use marijuana alone. So if you end you end that, uh, you you end really uh, two thirds of the drug war. There's a uh, a common libertarian saying to make make cannabis as legal as tomatoes. So I, I think that's a good thing to strive for. Take the government out of the government regulatory aspect out of it completely. Um, so let's stick stick with uh, talking about the drug war, but move to a, a different aspect of it. I think people look at cannabis. I'll use the proper the proper word, Michael. People look at cannabis and opioids, car- cannabis and heroin, uh, completely differently. And there's a lot of people that would be in favor of you know, fully legalizing uh, cannabis, but would definitely not want to do that with heroin, with, uh, with opioids. So what, it, what role do you think, if any, the government should have in regulating heroin? And we'll start this one with Michael. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think we're all too dumb to answer this question. And that's the entire point, because this is a public health issue which belongs in the hands of public health professionals and doctors who are empowered to go ahead and figure out the regulations of this, not the DEA who determines scheduling. I mean, that, or the Department of Justice, too. That, I mean, that shows you right there how preposterous the idea is that cannabis is Schedule One. I mean, every bit of evidence says in the entire world that cannabis is not a Schedule One drug. So we have to uh, kind of change the entire paradigm of how we're approaching this. Remember, whenever you say it's a police issue, that means comply or die. And that's extremely serious. That is tyranny. Whenever you advocate to use the force of the state, that means if you do not listen to what I am telling you, we will fucking kill you. You, you, Yeah, but you really believe it's at that extreme at this point? If we're looking at, at a majority of the people who wind up following us are, are people who respect the first level of patrol officer who are on the street. And at what point do we as responsible people who are no longer in law enforcement stop scaring the shit out of people by having them think that that's the end result of things. I, in, in my years, I, I don't know too many comply or die circumstances. I know comply or there's going to be consequences, but that that's a label right there that I don't think is responsible on our end to be terrorizing people to think that that's actually an, an issue. I would agree with you if you're talking about, um, you know, mass quantities of, of, you know, DEA doing raids and, and we're going to, uh, you know, drug homes. And, yeah, you comply or you pull something out and you're going to get, you know, lit up by uh, men with AR-15s. But when it comes down to the street cop working a traffic stop or somebody stopping somebody for, you know, Terry stop, I, I think that that's where people start getting scared of us because of that mentality that we've seen. We know it. We know what happens. But we can't convey that message. I think it's too heavy. 
Dominic, people should be afraid of us. We are the violent enforcement wing of the state, and any law means comply or die. That is a fact. I don't care if you don't agree with it or not. Whether If you get so much as a parking ticket and do not pay it, eventually that will lead to the state executing you unless you comply. You have not seen it's, a lot of comply that, or die that to me. you got to explain that to me because I'm not understanding how – now, I don't, I don't agree with traffic citations. I think traffic citations in and of themselves – for let's just say speeding, and that's the only thing you do. I think if you're cited, I think that the process of you taking a day off work, you going to court, you paying the ticket, you paying the fines, I think that's unconstitutional to violate your Eighth Amendment of excessive fines. How is that going to kill me in the long run? I'm a citizen. What happened? Like, how's, how's it going to kill me? you got to let me answer, brother. Yeah. When you, if, you, if you don't go to court, you will get a warrant issued for your arrest. If you do not comply with that warrant, you will be taken by force. If you do not comply with that force, then you will be executed. End of story. You will be executed on the street, and the system says you will receive no justice for that. That is what policing is. If you do not want to handle a situation other than comply or die, well, then it's not a situation for police to handle. So when someone is going crazy, shooting a gun, or being a threat to society, then yeah, we can all say comply or die in this situation. But when it's a traffic stop or a parking ticket or it's narcotics or it's a non or it's a consensual adult agreement, you, whether you want to rationalize it in any other way or not, we as a profession and as a society have determined that we will make you comply or we will kill you. I, I don't remember receiving that kind of training though. I don't ever remember I don't remember executing that on the streets. I remember executing the level of force necessary to effect an arrest. But in my years of, and I did work in a, in a decently violent community, um, I don't ever remember having the mentality of comply or die. And it's a dangerous mindset to wind up sharing that with new officers coming in who can be easily influenced into thinking that that just may well be the aspect. Furthermore, I'm not, I'm not talking a personal issue. I am talking legally. What I, the I don't system see, I don't see is. You I'm cannot the, argue this, man. Guys, 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 we, we, we got we to go one at a time here. Well, that's Otherwise, fine. you can't hear anybody. I'm how it's legal. Comply or die legality. I, I was never educated in that. So if, if, if I could just jump in here, because I think you guys are kind of talking past each other. I, I think what, what Michael is talking about is just the, uh, the, the basic logical concept of if you have a law, the ultimate end of that law, if you don't follow it, is it's, I mean, the, the law is being enforced. If you don't follow a law, there's going to be violence against you at some point. Um, it's it's just the way that, that laws work. Obviously, if, if you kill someone and you evade the police, people are, the police are going to arrest you. If you're evading them, then they will and they will kill you. I mean, th that is the extreme. But from a basic level, if we're going to talk about you know parking tickets or a uh, you know you, you get arrested for uh, for selling heroin on the street or you don't pay your taxes. At the end of the day, if if you take that to its to its extreme, to its end, armed men are going to show up at your house and take you. And if you fight them, if you resist, if you fire on those armed men coming to take you, then you will get killed. So I think that Michael's just taking it to its logical end. I don't think he's saying that you know this is being taught in uh, police training. Is is that accurate? Is that does that help at all? Oh, as far as yeah, my, exactly, exactly. I think I might on anything results in that. If I want to keep eating McDonald's till I die, it's going to happen. If I want to cheat on a girlfriend who's got, uh, you know, jealousy issues, I could die. I think, I, but everything is indicative of my actions in that scenario. So law enforcement is going to be reactionary to someone else's actions. So again, too, maybe I'm just not understanding the point and, and I do understand the concept, but I just don't support the advocating that law enforcement is a comply or die entity. I, I can't get behind that. Rayford, do you have anything you want to contribute here? Well, you know, that's a lot of the things that, that gets uh, police officers who actually want to help and protect their community. Uh, when, you, when, you, when you turn that out, that's legitimate uh, uh, services. You know, to, uh, if someone steals from a person, you can go on, for, on in behalf of the victim and stop that person. And I, I guess if you do get an interaction with someone, with a, with a person who has has stolen or assaulted or killed another person, that, that I, you know, I guess that is a comply or die in a, a situation. You, hey, you're going to have to stop. You're going to have to return this property. If you, you know, if you fight us or try to shoot us, we're going to shoot you. That would be that would be a legitimate use of force. Uh, 
you know, but but when the government gets involved with issues like drug enforcement, then there really is no victim, and it's law enforcement that is the aggressor. And and then you you still have this this potentially deadly situation uh, with traffic stops and drug raids, and all of this is unnecessary, uh, and and it makes people fear law enforcement. It makes police officers fear the citizens, and that makes everyone unsafe. And that's one of the big reasons uh, that. Why I'm so against the drug war, even for evil heroin and crack cocaine and all of that. One, because it's actually our enforcement that that in the prohibition enforcement that creates all the harm and the danger anyway. Uh, and so you you put you put police officers and citizens in these deadly, potentially deadly situations on the side of the road or in a home for what? For no reason. And and that on that onus is on the, the police officer because He's the one initiating that violence and that threat of force when it when it comes to um, to enforcing uh, these laws like drug enforcement. Now, if you have an assault or an actual crime, that's a that's a little bit different. And, and that's where I think some police officers get confused and get really defensive as well, because some of their work is legitimate. That does require use of force. A great deal of it doesn't, though, and it's unnecessary. Yeah, that's, that's that's a great point. I, I want to make sure – I think we have an agreement here lost in all of this. I, I, I could be wrong, but did, did we all agree – did the three of you agree that heroin, uh, opioids is a medical issue and is not something that should be legislated, should not be police, people should not be arrested – for using or, or selling heroin, or did we not get agreement there? Did, does no, anyone using, yes. Using, yeah, I agree with the using. I agree with uh, that people should not be arrested for uh, using. Uh, selling, no, I, I, I honestly think if you're, if we know where this is at right now, and we know the massive number of deaths that this leads to, and people are selling, I think that's a different story. But the usage of it, no, I think people need help. They don't need, they don't need jail, and they sure as hell don't need fines. Do you think that, do you think the prohibition against Against heroin, uh, against selling heroin, do you think that has helped up until this point? I don't think I. You know, but I spent uh, years, years and years. We we were out there throwing, uh, you know, anybody who even had residue on a needle, you know, in jail with a class four felony. And then I sat there and and was baffled at how you know our command staff would stop and do a juke and say, okay, well now all these people that you've arrested ruined their lives over the years. Now we have this program saying that they can come up to you and turn their drugs in and blah blah blah. blah. And we were baffled knowing that people wouldn't trust these uniformed police officers who they they're who ruined their lives for years. So it's it's not a black and white issue because you're you you take heroin, you use heroin, your life goes upside down. Well maybe you gotta make a living now, so now you gotta sell it to keep yourself uh, fed and the lights turned on. So there's a there's a lawful answer I'll give and a, and a compassionate answer I give. I'd love to be able to give everyone treatment and I'd love to give everybody um uh, a, a nice big giant hug and say, my God, we're gonna help you. But then again too non-usage, selling of it, selling of it, knowing what you're contributing to, that's got to be held accountable in some way. And if we're right now, we're at that law being arrested, or uh, law enforcement being involved in it, then until we get something better, so be it. Anyone else have anything to add on that point? Yeah, like I don't understand how Dominic squares the empirical fact that punishment does not reduce crime whatsoever. So instead of doing like doing nothing is better than doing the drug war and putting people in 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 cells. I mean, the, the admission right there was that since I don't have a better option and I'm not intelligent enough to come up with a better option, I, I wish they would get help. But I'm, I'm comfortable with putting them in a cage since and, and actually making the situation worse since I don't feel like create thinking creatively, creatively. I don't understand what, that. What, what would whatsoever. you what, so and go ahead. What's your solution? I mean, I just told you, we have to trust doctors in this. You don't put somebody into a criminal justice system that we know you, increases you worked, their chances. You worked in Baltimore, correct? You worked in Baltimore? Yeah, but I was answering your previous question. No, we I'm, have I'm, I'm asking a question. You worked in Baltimore, which we know has a very high uh, uh, crime uh, issue. Is that correct? Uh, we don't know. We have no idea how much crime is committed. Crime stats are a measure of police activity, not uh, not human activity. Oh, okay, so I would say I would venture to guess that as a Baltimore police officer, you probably saw more in your first year than a lot of suburban cops seen in ten. Is would that be correct? Yeah, yeah, I mean, easy. Okay, 
And and could you in any way whatsoever attribute drug usage to linking it to someone's to someone's personal activity and wind up uh, their criminal action? Does, does does drug use at all lead to in any way, shape, or form somebody doing something non-drug related but criminal? No, absolutely not. There's no okay. correlation to drug so you use. Never, you never there. saw you never saw people draw. Oh my gosh! Would you let me finish, please, Dominic? Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. There's no scientific or empirical evidence that links drug usage to committing crimes. In fact, they are much more likely to be a victim of a crime than to commit a crime, just like people with mental health issues when we like to paint the issues as, oh, we have a mental health issue. But your entire philosophy is grounded in individual accountability, and that's that doesn't square with science either. We're the product of our experiences and all these other variables and factors. To do that whole bootstraps things with people that don't have bootstraps and you think you're going to put take away more bootstraps and somehow that's going to help them, to help communities, we have to think about what will actually help the community. And there's no way, shape or form that taking a father out of the household and putting them into a prison cell is that answer. Literally not doing that is better. I don't think anybody advocated putting somebody in a prison cell. It was law and being accountable. Um, my question was, is so then on your aspect, you don't believe that training and experience have anything to do with law enforcement you're all about science and empirical evidence then so a rookie should have the same ability as your 11 years on the job as a cop then no and i have i have no idea what that means well you when i sat there and i asked if you don't think that that crimes are related to drug issues uh, my my issue was or my my instance was going to be have you ever seen anybody a drug deal gone bad Anybody shot or anybody uh, beaten up over a, a little bag of weed or heroin? Have you ever seen anything like that? No, I have seen people that have gotten shot or gotten to bad situations because they were suffering through the consequences of economic inequalities, not having a father into their home, socioeconomic opportunity lacking. Those are the scientific things that we know cause crime. That's what they were suffering from. You are attaching a, a symptom and you're ta- causing it and you are labeling it a cause and it is not. It is an outcome. Okay, so you ever no? Here's here's a question. Um, I had a real stressful day the other day. I mean, it was the holidays. It was ridiculous. It was family going at each other's throat. And at the end of the day, I had a beer and cigar, drugs. I had nicotine and I had alcohol, and it made my life a little bit better by calming me down. So when you have somebody who doesn't have a family in the home, or somebody who is maybe you have six kids, you look you look at poor black communities or Hispanic communities who have six people living in a two-bedroom apartment with no air in the summertime, and they don't have a job, and they wind up turning to something as an escape, like drugs, there, there's no correlation between the drugs and then the outcome of their, their, their criminal behavior. It's only going to be socioeconomical then? No, again, there is no evidence that drug usage leads to more crime. People who use drugs are more likely to be the victim of a crime. Okay. So uh, I'm not sure if you guys have have heard of this book, but a guy I had on this podcast previously, a guy by the name of Johan Hari, he wrote a book called Chasing the Scream. And I would recommend that everyone listening to this, that that the three of you read it, because what he does in the book, and he's he's from uh, he's from England. And, you know, so he he has a view of the the drug war as a whole. The book is about the, the international effects of the war on drugs. And in it, he t- he talks about a lot of stuff. He goes and he you know interviews and spends time with people dealing drugs on the streets and in inner city uh, in the United States and foreign countries and South America, all over the place. He interviews scientists, and the the one thing when he's talking to a scientist that the scientist talks about an experiment that they did with rats, and the fir- the first experiment that they did is they put they put rats in a cage with water that had heroin in it and they made the situation for them terrible um they took all the toys out they took you know they couldn't the rats couldn't have any sex um they they were isolated um it was basically basically like the rats were in solitary confinement all of those rats there was they had a choice between drinking water with heroin and just regular drinking water and in that circumstance all of the rats drank the water with the heroin in it and they did a second experiment with um they gave they gave the rats everything they could want. They had all kinds of toys. They could have sex with other rats. And the same two choices for water. Water with heroin in it 
or just plain water. And all of those rats did try the water with heroin in it, but they all came back and drank just the regular drinking water. So, so what's the point of this? The point is, none of us, uh, when I say none of us, the, the uh, political uh, spectrum here in the United States, our, our politicians, our leaders, no one is looking at the root cause of the war on drugs, which is the, the reason why people are taking drugs, because we have a lot of people who are suffering and have shitty lives. They have terrible lives. They have no hope, and they're and they're trying to you know try to make themselves feel better. Just like you said, Dominic, with the cigar and with the uh, with the alcohol, you know that's a normal thing to do. It's not a normal thing to go and do heroin. But a lot of these people have nothing to live for, so we need to fix that that problem at the root. And I guess have you guys you guys heard of this book, Chasing the Screen by Johan Hari? No, but I guess that that kind of shows one point that we needed to talk about earlier, as far as uh, drugs uh, having a, a connection to criminal activity. Is uh, I think we can all agree that substance, any kind of chemical substance, changes a person's behavior, doesn't it? It, it doesn't mean it's for the worst, man. It doesn't mean it's for the worst. You are throwing so many conjectures out there that I don't even know how we would respond to them. You, know, you respond to them based on your experience. You know, the one thing you have to do is you have to stop irresponsibly picking up anything you read on the Internet and act, and, and act like that is the, the, the baseline test for everything in humanity. You're talking about the fact of 10 minutes ago that Baltimore doesn't keep the proper uh, criminal records on there, but then you want to say that science is proving the drug act, the drug interaction with people, a human being. You're training an experience. I didn't say, you, you come from I didn't, Baltimore. I didn't say that. Baltimore is a, it's, it's a town that, man, you guys worked your asses off. And for you to deny what you saw and put the human element on the correlation of what you saw is either disingenuous or you're trying for a platform that just doesn't make sense. You, you know what you saw and you know what you went through. All of us did. Anyone who served a human being, we know the truth about what drugs do. They alter behavior. Uh, they, they, can I, can I go in on that? Go ahead, Rafe. Yeah. So, uh, even if they drugs certainly can cause harm, and they and they can cause uh, you know negative effects on people. That is absolutely true. Uh, the question is becomes a different thing, and that is your response to it. And, and Correct. that's when I want to kind of challenge police officers. Even if it is harmful, you know, in, in a way, it's not violence and and so when you as a police officer when you criminalize something you make something illegal it, it, we do we get into that I, I won't go other we won't shoot you but we will use force and and when is that okay to initiate a uh, physical force or violence against another person uh, well it's it's bad for you so to do that that's totally separate than whether drugs cause harm or not and and so and it is it is not okay to initiate that violence against another person, and that's what law enforcement does when you criminal. Okay, well, explain to me, explain to me when use. law enforcement explain to me when law enforcement initiates violence or use of force against somebody who is using it. If we if we take if you take somebody out of their home, e even or use or trade or sale, that's okay, adult you gotta, consensual. You gotta, that's adult consensual activity, and that in, in just even the threat of it. Now I'm talking. Yeah, I know you say you say. Well, we, you know, we very rarely shoot anybody or anything. I, I totally agree. And police officers, you know, don't don't want to get in that situation. But but when you go, you pull someone out of their car and you put handcuffs on them, uh, that's using force against them, even if you do it all very nicely, like well, showing uh, up on a scene, showing up on your scene, your presence is using force on them. Yeah, right. The very very first step in. In a, in a use of force continuous officer presence. So why are you even there? Uh, again, a, adult consensual what use. You have to lay out, you have to lay whether you consider them are generally harmful or not, does should not require uh, you know a threat of violence. Uh, that where, that's where, the, that's where, where law enforcement makes Where is mistake. the there though? I'm using air quotes. Where's the there? If you're talking about somebody who's sitting on their front lawn smoking a pipe. Uh, somebody's in their house, or are you talking about somebody who got stopped for, I don't know, speeding, and uh, in plain sight, a cop sees you know a small little baggie on the floor that's torn, and then he does an investigation. W where's the there? That's what I'm trying to understand. Uh, 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 what maybe I'm maybe I'm in the minority here, which it seems so. Now you guys have to understand. I support being people being able to do what they want in life as long as it doesn't harm someone else. Don't steal from someone else. Don't hurt someone else. 
That that's that doesn't bother me. But when it comes down to, we have three former police officers and two of which are demonizing this passion of what people chose to do based on, I don't know what we're basing this on, but your guys are making out cops to be these evil tyrants, which I've yet to see that evidence of. I don't think they are evil tyrants. I I do believe that they're, uh, and I was not, I wanted to help the community and I, you know, I saw, uh, you know, lots of harm associated with drug use that I wanted to stop them and uh, just, to help the people in my neighborhood, but I but I also saw that what we did was very counterproductive. It actually, again, increased the violence, like I talked about earlier. But yeah, so you had talked about when when you pull someone over and you see a a, a baggy in their car. Uh, if if they're not intoxicated or impaired to the point where they're a danger to other people on the road, if it's the passengers or they're just carrying it, just like pharmacy gets their deliveries every single day, then there's no danger, and there's no yeah, reason for you, law you, enforcement you to be said, involved. You've said nothing I disagree with. Uh, everything you just said there is is complete sanity. That makes okay. sense to me. Yeah, but, I'm cool. Uh, but it's going back to uh, going back to you know officers initiating use of force. When you kick a conversation off like that, well, we know that's not true. Well, that's that's well when you when you serve when you go into a person's home on a drug warrant, a drug search warrant. Okay. Is is that not Initiating use of force, you kick in the door. Well, for the most Shove part, gun piece of- if a, sure, if a, if a judge winds up mandating that, you got a no-knock warrant, which aren't too common nowadays. Uh, I, I won't right. disagree with you on that. It does put people in danger. Hell, I've served no-knock warrants where I was the right. You were the guy one. And in, you were the one the initiating that. The door. So you were going I, into people's home to, you know, okay, if that's where the ratio, initiating. Violence. But here, here again, what's the ratio of no-knock warrants being served? Versus patrol officers, who by and large are what public associates with as law enforcement, doing their jobs on service calls, traffic stops, or consensual contacts. Hey, well, I was a patrol officer, and we did lots of traffic stops, and part of our mandate was get guns and drugs off the streets. And so that's what we did. We would pull people over you know, for not using their turn signal long enough or – or you know, having a tag light out, and then we would try to build that into right, some type up. of it, in some type of drug search. Right. Absolutely. We did that all the time. Did it but all the my time. My point is, is my point is, is and that I and stopped, that is. Uh, but if I stop 400 cars a month, I'm doing maybe one warrant every you know every month. So the ratio is is different. And, and I would say that they're well. First of all, they're unnecessary, and also there is a a there's no justification for that initiation of violence that's part of why uh that's where law enforcement gets misguided when it comes down to things like like cannabis uh, you know i'm gonna agree with you you know i've said it a million times i'm, I'm getting tired sure. of the, uh, you know the, the cannabis why we're even enforcing that stuff <laughs> my my logical brain is going to say well if in my small town in my small area you know we had 30 overdoses of heroin associated um in the late in, in one year then maybe that is an issue that we want to look at to enforce. And yes, and, and you know, I'm going to go back to what Michael uh, criticized me not having an education enough on this. Well, in, in my limited uh, education, then I'm going to say if my job is to serve and to keep people alive and protect them, then I, until we find a better way of, of solving this heroin problem, then I do believe that we should continue to knock in doors and, and you know, take out uh, dealers who are dealing heroin, something that is violent, something that is causing a problem. That's my sense on that. But when it comes down to usage, anything else like that, I think I think a lot of this, unfortunately, what people are hearing from this conversation is, you know, two, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I am going to take the polarizing side, but two officers who are, they're demonizing cops and cops are bad and cops are going to kill you and cops are going to do this. We, we, have, we, have to, we have to responsibly watch our dialogue with that. I think we're we're not going to agree here, but I, I will just say I don't think that Michael and Rayford are demonizing cops. I think they're demonizing, or they're not. I think they're criticizing the current system that puts cops in a uh, difficult situation, that puts cop, cops in in situations uh, where violence is maybe more likely to occur, and maybe even a less safe situation for them. And I don't think we're we're going to agree on this today, so I do want to move on, but. I do want to say I think we have agreement that cannabis should be legalized. So there we go. That's, let's I'm, take, I'm uh, fine with that. Take, I'm, that yeah, I, I have no issue with that. 
Let's take credit for that one. I know many of you are facing major decisions with your health care right now, and I want to make sure that you know about an amazing alternative to your standard corporatized health insurance known as Health Excellence Plus. Health Excellence Plus is an incredible program that helps you keep medical costs under control by taking charge of your own health care and not leaving all the decisions about what doctors you see, and what procedures you need or don't need up to some corporate bureaucrat. Along with providing 24-7 access to medical professionals, tax-deferred health savings accounts, and preventative care, Health Excellence Plus empowers you to finally take control of your health care. To learn more, head on over to lionsofliberty.com slash health or call the special hotline for Lions of Liberty listeners at 855-290-4447. Be sure to mention Lions of Liberty. So let's move on to something less controversial. Just kidding. Gun control. So, and we'll start start this one with uh, with Michael. And Michael, I, th- I maybe I'm wrong, but I think your, your view has evolved um, on gun control. Maybe since we last talked, or maybe maybe it hasn't. But you know, w- in wake of these uh, mass shootings that we've had, especially thinking of uh, of Las Vegas, in your mind, do you think that there needs to be more gun control or less? Um, well, I have my position, so we'll just go with what my position is because I, I don't, I, again, I don't think of gun control as kind of like the framing that I would even want to put that. The first thing I want to say is, is I, I have to say it real fast. We, we have people overdosing and having a heroin epidemic because of the drug war, not because Absol- we're not absolutely, doing it hard absolutely. enough. Okay. Absolutely. And the most and Rayford nor I have ever criticized police. We only criticize policing and policing is incredibly dangerous to not just the citizens. There is no greater threat to the police officer's life than policing, as we have just described it. But moving on to gun control is that um, I, th- I think the, mo- the beautiful thing about the Constitution was that it's supposed to be a living and breathing document that reevaluates the positions for the current time. And if we were to say, let's stop and reevaluate what we need by gun control, we would have to conclude that we don't want people having uh, atomic weapons because the government has atomic weapons. So we all already have to agree there's a line. And I, I don't think that fighting the greatest military force that has ever existed in the history of humanity is a rational position. But what is a rational position is to have home defense. And if you, I think you should have the right to home defense, which would mean the best weapon for home defense is a shotgun. And a pump shotgun really doesn't isn't tied to much crime whatsoever. Uh, it, it's it's a it's the ultimate home defense weapon. You can protect yourself. You can protect your family. Law enforcement can see it. I'm comfortable with that as some sort of a compromise somewhere in there. I think that hunters have an absolute right to be able to use a firearm to get their gun. I don't think hunters should be relying on the concept of destroying the most powerful military force ever so that they can go hunt they should have a right to have a rifle to go hunt but the be- if you're any decent of a hunter you can have a bolt action rifle and the way that we end up stopping that is we just end up stopping manufacturing regulating the manufacturing ceasing manufacturing of handguns semi-automatic weapons and eventually you get to a point where the supply and demand makes it more of an investment piece than a piece worth committing crime And 200 years from now, we have done it. I don't want to take anybody's guns away from them. I think we have to take a super slow approach. Okay. And I'm not going to debate anything you said, Michael. If anyone wants to hear (laughs) Michael and I debate this topic, you can go back and listen to episode 40 of Felony Friday, where we got into a a little bit. I'll kick it to... Hold on. Let me me add that in there real quick, though, because there is one point that you have given me and Dave has given me that I relent to. And that is from the libertarian position... If you end the drug war and you legalize drugs, I will completely re-envision the entire scenario and we can start from scratch. That's a, that's a fair point. Um, let's, let's kick it to, to Rayford. Um, do we need more I, or less? I, I, can we go back for one second? I want Michael to clarify a point. Just sure. when, if you legalize drugs, does your stance on weapons change where you're going to need to uh, you'll, you'll allow you'll back up anybody owning any kind of weapon then? Or can you elaborate on that a little? Yeah, because of the context of America having the drug war, dramatic levels of income inequality, and hyper-segregation, we have a lot of these factors that also contribute to crime. 
And uh, like, so fundamentally from a rational position, guns don't commit, commit crimes, humans commit crimes. And, and, uh, but I think that we're apes and we're not going to be able to change ourselves. We're always going to do crazy, violent shit. So we have to do other methods to kind of mitigate the harm that we do. Now, because of the drug war instilling all these other causations of crimes and furthering them, uh, maybe if, if, if we end the drug war and all the crime that ends with that, then our numbers change so much but I think my argument would lose a lot of steam. So I'm, I just want that clarification. So legal drugs would mean less uh, less arm people, or you want more, or you want people to be able to arm themselves more at that point. That's what I'm trying to understand. No, I, no, 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 no. I think that a legalized drug market, and this isn't a think thing. Like other countries do this. We are we are one country amongst a lot of other ones and a lot of other societies. That if we legalize a drug market and, and we regulate that in a public health aspect, then we will have many less reasons for people to be using guns. Okay. Uh, Rayford? Yes. I'm trying to be con- kind of consistent with my view on on, uh, on drug usage and gun usage. Uh, guns are kind of the same way. They can be immensely beneficial and they can also be very dangerous and cause harm. Uh, now, again, your what is your response to that? Uh, and, uh, you know, if someone, uh, you know, has a weapon in their home or even carries it in their car and they're not harming anyone, then, you know, where's your right to go in there and try to seize it from them? Um, I don't I don't see how you have that that right. Now, if you want to go to someone else's property and wield a gun, then you're going to, you know. You're going to have to talk to them and get their permission first. Uh, I, you know, I, I, the times you know that I carried a gun as a police officer, and that that somehow that I had, and so I carry a gun as a police officer. Now, I Rayford Davis is no longer a police officer. Somehow, I'm less qualified to carry a gun and to carry carry a weapon. Or less necessary, uh, you know. I, I I'm some kind of a different person now. I, actually, I'm in some ways I have a higher responsibility as a citizen, or held to a higher standard uh, using a weapon than a than a police officer is. Um, so, uh, you know, and it are should there be regulations again about where you carry a weapon and everything? Uh, I would say yes. And I would also say that the government is the, probably the worst agency in the world to be the one uh, dictating those regulations. Either way, either your freedom of it or, res- or, or getting people to use them in a responsible manner, uh, the government's pretty much fallen flat on their face. Oh, yeah, and the government has a few weapons themselves. And, uh, yeah, they've killed a few folks with them, too. And, uh, and so, you know, if you're going to take guns away from anybody, uh, you know, hey, let's, let's look at uh, – Let's look at the military. So, so Rayford, would you want, um, would you favor less control on firearms? Would you favor, for example, automatic weapons being legalized? Well, you know, they're, they're legal now. You just got to pay the permits and the and the fines right. and yeah, fees. They're, they're, so they're sort of quasi legal, yeah. right? And in, in in a lot of ways, that's actually worse. Uh, so. I don't I don't see where where government has that has that right, particularly, you know, if you even if you look at the Constitution uh, or, or where do where do I have that right to go into a neighbor? He has an automatic weapon and he's done. Hey, what's that? Can I answer a couple of those? Like Hold on, I, 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 I want to give I want to give we'll, we'll have a we'll discussion right. after. I want to give uh, Dominic a chance right. to, uh, real, to chime real in real fast. And maybe I'm the dumbest one in the group, so you have to forgive me. But. Uh, my views are that the Second Amendment is the most important amendment that we have because without it, you can't protect any of the other amendments. And we talk, I'm talking about this a million times. You got a bunch of place of commas in this very short sentence, but the only place that it is selected out that says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Nothing else. Nothing. Not the militia. Not the secretary. Not the free state. Arms, by definition, weapons and ammunition. All of that, so we can't really categorize what what the founding fathers even thought about. But what I find really interesting is, I'm holding my 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 Chinese made SKS, my my uh, passed down heirloom SKS, which is unloaded, and it, it is it is an inanimate object that does nothing 
unless I wind up utilizing it. The gun in and of itself is nothing. We want to legalize drugs. We want to legalize drugs which, when taken, alters human beings' behaviors, mindsets, sometimes personalities, yet holding a physical inanimate object in my hand will do nothing to alter my behavior, my mindset, or my personality. I'm, I'm failing to find the argument where it connects between uh, legalizing drugs on one thing, but we're going to we're going to maintain uh, a, a restriction on firearms. I, I can't comprehend this. Michael, you had uh, you had something you wanted to say? Oh, absolutely. So <laughs> to, to, to talk to Rayford on why he says why someone would want to take guns. And that is because a handgun empirically, without a doubt, makes every situation more dangerous. Every cop knows this. They are trained from day one to always your life is in danger. And why? Because there's always the presence of a gun, your own. So even when you call the police officer, you empirically make the life of everyone that you are around and including yourself in a more dangerous situation. And I, I, pretty, I, pretty much agree, I pretty much agree with that, Michael. I, 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 well, I, I'm just answering your question. You said why. So let me, uh, where the why is, is because the Constitution also says that, and, and case law is well established, that your rights end where someone else's begin. And my rights to a free safety to not have you endanger me by the presence of bringing a gun is the legal argument for that. I believe that, too. You are empirically, even when you go into a house, if a, if a police officer goes into a school, he, is, he or she is empirically putting those children at a greater risk because of that handgun. So what do, what do we do with the other people who what do we do with all the people who don't follow the laws and don't? Don't respect the ideals that you have. What do we do with those people? Well, I mean, laws are not a measure of morality or something we should be doing. So people that commit violent crimes, we address them the way we commit violent crimes. I've written entire books and tons on this. Uh, okay, I get I, into the how, nuance. How are we, if we're, if we're going to, because it sounds like a solution, let's talk about a school for a second. If we remove police officers' ability to carry into a school and you have somebody who had a real bad day, argued with their wife, wants to end their lives, and they decide to bring a, a gun to school as a teacher and shoot everything up because they don't care. They don't follow the rules. They, wh where is the, the, the rationale and where is the, um, the morals and the ethics? And I, I, I'm trying to find a, a common ground of saying that we should all live in a, a land where I love you, you love me, and let's all get along. It, it just, it's okay, I, I, I'm a, okay. Hey, man, let me answer. Sure. So... We do this, and like other countries do this. I don't understand why we're in this bubble. What are the, of what being... are the countries? You serious? Australia. No. So uh, Australia? You do know yeah. that Australia banned dr uh, crime, uh, guns, and they destroyed a bunch of guns, but you know the only ones who are actually committing the crimes there now are criminals with guns. Yeah, that's great. Uh, that's who always commits crimes is criminals, dude. So, so how do we defend the, ourselves against them? You do it through metrics that address the causations of crime, not the symptoms. So again, I've written a ton of books on this. You can read them and look at to see why it is. But we have to approach them for looking at the causes. You are looking at the symptoms and saying, how do we address the symptoms? You don't address symptoms. Symptoms are symptoms, dude. Well, if I got, so, if I got, a, cold, if I got a cold and I got snot running out of my nose and the snot running out of my nose is a symptom of it, and I would like that to stop, I'm going to take some medicine so that dries some up. And eventually deal with. And you didn't solve the so, problem, dummy. You have you to would, fight the virus or the bacteria. So just let so me. You would. Talk. You would rather Please. have. You would rather have an innocent victim killed, uh, by with somebody who has a, a gun versus somebody who doesn't defend them with a gun, just to prove a point that that's that's the symptom. That's the symptom. We need to address the problem. I, or am I just? Or am I way off on your logic? Yeah, yeah, man. I didn't say any of that. So well, again, moving on with what I was saying, dude, I'm not going to chase goalposts. Let me finish. Goalposts. Let me finish. So to answer your question, Rayford, on why, because when you're not a cop anymore, that things have changed. Yeah, things have dramatically changed because you're not empowered by the authority of the state anymore to carry that gun and execute violence by their their justification and, and, and they're asking of you to do so. The Second Amendment is the very reason why we have this fear and that, Dominic, you're responding like this with fear. Your fear on top it's of fear. It's not responding as fear. You're talking about law enforcement advocating violence and you're talking no, about fear. Let me we, talk. 
There's a mental problem. All right, I'm, stop, I'm gonna stop. Hey, talking. hey, guys, 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 hold on, hold on. Michael, give 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 Dominic a minute. I mean, you guys are going back and forth, so. No, it, it's just you can't responsibly. You're you, if you have a problem with law enforcement, I respect that. That's that's your experience. That is what you gained out of the 11 years you served. We all saw things differently. I still believe in the inherent brilliance of the Constitution. I believe in the pride, the integrity of every man and woman who straps on a gun belt, goes into harm's way, does not wake up that morning and say, I think I'm going to kill for the state, and I think it's irresponsible, foolish, and it's a little bit sadistic that that's where your mindset is. You can't have that. That's, you, are, you are dishonoring thousands. No, 1.1. You are dishonoring 1.1 million men and women who do the job that you and I no longer do. You can't have that mindset. Okay, man. Look, dude, I'm a scholar. I do not care about your anecdotal accounts or my anecdotal accounts. Well, you're a scholar, I'm and that's sp- why you didn't make a good cop. We don't want right, scholars. Man. We want people who care. Hey, guys, guys, guys. We're, uh, we're not going to get into calling each other names and get into personal attacks on each other. Let's, let's keep it to the issues because that's, that's just a waste of time. So is is there any is there anything new that anyone wants to bring to the table talking okay, about gun so rights, Second Amendment gun say, control? Let me say the presence of a gun does not change your biology. That's why little beta males get all excited to have their automatic weapon and feel like a man. It does change your yeah. chemistry just as much as a as a drug does, and it leads you to saying foolish things like "Let's have guns around our children." Are you married? Do you have kids? We're going to move on to policing questions. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a legitimate question because having being a mar- being a married man with kids boosts your testosterone because you wind up having to be more of an alpha male at home. So that changes your uh, your chemistry and your makeup. I'm not married. You just totally kids. you just totally made that up. There's no science to support that whatsoever. Okay, I think I think, I think we're getting no way. I think we're I think we're getting off course here, guys. Um, and and we're not gonna we're not gonna come to an agreement here. Um, I think I think one thing is important to point out. I, I will point out areas of agreement, and you might not realize it, but I think there is an area where all three of you agree, and that is that we should have firearms for home defense. I think we obviously disagree on what we should be allowed to have for home defense. Um, Great. You know, that word should but, that word should is dangerous because I have no right to tell you what to put in your body if we're not if not not it. should should have the right we should do. We have, do have the right the... we do have the right to second amendment correct but uh, the reason i say that and it's important because there are a lot of people out there in the united states that want to take that right away hell no is that fair yes a lot of so, people who are not uh <laughs> a lot of people are foolish i would agree with that i, I think i think we've uh we've beat this horse to a to a pulp here so <laughs> So, so we'll move on, and I, I do want to talk about. You know, it hasn't been in the news as much, just because the news has been in crazy lately. But I think it's an important topic, and it really, I mean, it has roots in everything that we've already talked about, and that is Black Lives Matter. And I want to talk about it as an organization. Is it positive? Is it negative? Is it is it helping anything? Is it actually harming the situation with uh, police? It, interacting with communities is is black lives matter a a good thing and we'll start with rayford uh you know i don't know much about the organization uh but you know we're going to talk a little bit about you know kind of racism and policing and everything um and 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 just kind of my my view on that and and the truth is law enforcement has always it been a historically uh, racially oppressive organization. I'm here in you know Charleston, South Carolina, and that's you know modern policing in the 1800s was was slave patrols and and uh, you know policing organizations to patrol the black neighborhoods. That's how they started off. And modern that, policing started off with Sir Robert Peel's Nine Principles of Policing, not slavery. That is absolutely is that, completely wait, untrue. Like, no, wait, like, stop. Okay, that is that, completely that, false. That's why we talk about that Sir Robert Peel is accredited for uh, creating the inception of, of modern policing. Right. A well, British I, policing, I, brother. British policing. I'm a scholar. This is my field. Like, this is ahead. the time to stop talking. That is yeah, patently untrue. Yeah, okay. Okay? I have yeah, written a book. Your views. Michael, I've written Michael. articles. All right, no, Michael, Michael. the articles Michael. of the history of policing. That is, 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 no, you can't just let lies go. That is completely untrue. It's ahistorical. Look, 
could you lower your voice a little bit? It's fine. Yeah, fine to keep talking. And I'll speak about Robert Peel in just a moment. But uh, yeah, so we've had we've had you know hi- historically uh, racist and oppressive missions uh, with law enforcement uh, throughout its history, and it's been uh, the, the disparity in the in the kind of the policing is directed at poor communities and minority communities. Uh, we've had that, and and now today is law enforcement uh, racist, and you know. But I consider myself racist? Absolutely not. My police department, were we racist? Absolutely not. Had very good uh, you know, black leadership and even the white leadership. They wouldn't tolerate that, that type of, um, of mindset within a police officer or anything. Yet you look at the racial dis- uh, disparities in our arrest rates were quite high. And, and so – what what is kind of going on and and what it is particularly this is what it with drug enforcement we we've seen that that at the end of the civil rights movement and and the end of segregation and the kind of the jim crow laws and they went over to use drug enforcement to perpetuate those back in the 60s and 70s and so they would take these laws and say yeah well they apply to everybody but we're going to really police them over here because, well, you just don't want those, you know, cocaine fueled Negroes getting out of control. So you, you go there and you patrol those neighborhoods. And it and when you criminalize communities like that, we, like we've done for generations, it perpetuates that racial disparity. And so law enforcement would swear we're not racist. We're not. We're not. But we go where the crime is, and but they have pe- perpetuated really kind of the destabilization of these minority communities for generations, and so these communities are destabilized, and they have more quote unquote crime that law enforcement looks after, and so they arrest more people, and it just perpetuates to this day. And so a lot of police officers are kind of confused. They're like, geez, we're not racist. They get really upset and offended because they're not. And I totally agree that by most, most parts they're not and are good and well intended. Yet our arrest rates and really our, our methods of policing have stayed the same from when it was historically and structurally racist. So why are we surprised that we still have these results and that people are, are upset about it? Uh, Michael, did you want to chime in there? Uh, no, I mean, I think really for white dudes talking about Black Lives Matter is probably going to be wrong anyway. Um, and yeah, it's, I, it's, probably, <laughs> it's probably a good point, but it doesn't mean that we can't you know, get something beneficial out of it. And, yeah, I mean, I really think – I mean, I, this is going to be hard, I guess, for, for a lot of people to swallow. But, I mean, I think it's largely ineffective and irrelevant at this point. It's, it, uh, it got – like everything else consumed ever since the election – is like uh, I mean we're all like no ma- regardless of Dominic's positions and my positions what we dispute on we're gonna have a hard time talking to anybody but about it because everyone is just like as entrenched in these these sides and isn't really trying to hear uh, thoughtful discussions and and look for solutions. Dominic, did you have well, any thoughts? Your original, on this? your original question was about Black Lives Matter, correct? Correct. If yes. we go back to it, I do not know much about the inception of it, how it started. I believe that any group, and I've said this a million times. You take any positive culture, any positive group, you look at, you know, Italian pride, gay pride, Hispanic pride, um, Catholic pride, doesn't name what it is. Anytime we wind up doing anything for pride purposes or humor purposes or positive purposes, it's great. But the second that it starts getting into the negative aspects, then it's you're you're the bad guy for calling it out. Um, I think the way that it was advertised, the way that it has been shown, the way that it has been marketed. Black Lives Matter has become, regardless of its good intent, has become a very bad organization that I, I have no support for or, uh, or or liking whatsoever. When you advocate or you do not demon or you do not speak out against uh, pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon, or what do we want more dead cops? Uh, when when we when we wind up uh, showcasing that, uh, I can't get behind that group. I'm sorry. All right, so I want to talk about um, the any treatment, any negative treatment, or or supportive. Uh, response you've gotten from current members of the police force and we'll start this one off with with dominic because i know that he 
he has some stuff to share in this probably. It is what it is. You know what? And I couldn't care less. I know exactly what I'm defending, what I stick up for. And the problem is, is when you wind up having the title taken away from you, um, you are immediately looked at as suspect. And I make no mistakes about it. I went in, I demanded my chief's resignation for his involvement in three cases. Um, and three weeks later, we find that I'm charged on department policy violations and separated from my department. With all the in with men who are men and women who are in my field, they don't they don't look at the, the the cause. They look at the effect, and there must be something wrong with me. And the problem is, is I do believe that a lot of young cops, you get you get stuck in the middle. You got three three aspects. You got the the newer guys, guys in the middle. That's where my career was. You know, I had about another I could have done another uh, 17, 18 years. And the guys at the end, guys the the sandwich guys, the bread of the sandwich, the beginning and the end, they're setting their ways. You know, new ones want to do exactly what they're told. And the old guys, they don't want any raves because they want to just ride their years out. It's the ones in the middle who understand the truth of what the job is. And those are the ones that I connect with a lot more. Um, but it's those two breads in the sandwich that are just, they're hard-headed. They see black and white. And they are quick to uh, quick to offer judge without uh, too much investigation. So what's what's the chief criticism been from current cops towards you? It's a personality conflict. They can't stand the fact that, I'm no longer restricted by department policy. And one of my big things is I'm, I'm very big on use of force. Um, and I will take a video and I will put it up online. And it doesn't matter how old the video is. I will talk about what I have a problem with. And it's amazing how many cops cannot stand the fact that I'm, quote unquote, perpetuating the negative spotlight instead of what I, what I, what I uh, like to look at is trying to better ourselves. Um, if I put a video up of a cop beating a, a, a black woman in, in a, a convenience store with a baton 18 times, and show this woman can't put her hands behind her back because you're beating her and she's instinctively trying to defend herself. I get cops going, oh, you're, 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 you're perpetuating hate. You're, you're perpetuating the negative sign of this, where my view is, no, the guy in the video did that in the first place. So I got so much praise and positivity from cops when I did my video on compliance. But the second I started calling out stuff that I see that I can't stand, that's when people started to turn and say, oh, you, you, you're making us look bad by pointing stuff out. Uh, Michael, what kind of experience have you had from, have you had any, anyone criticize? Have you had people, uh, obviously you've had people support you when you were a member of LEAP. That's that whole organization is former law enforcement, but have you had people call you out for your views? No, I mean, not for my views, as you can witness, uh, in this very phone call, <laughs> my, my issues are led to character attacks and skirting the issue and people, uh, because essentially what my work is, is explaining what policing is and how we're, we, we need to change and why those things are wrong that we have done. But what that really does is it tells people like Dominic that what he's been fighting for for 16 years was really for nothing. And that's a hard pill for all of us to swallow. And it puts us in a defensive mode and makes us say things and skirt the issues. Like the bottom line is it doesn't matter how much of an arrogant asshole I am and whatever character attacks we've launched, we're talking about policing and the systemic structure of what policing is. And so there's a long history attached to this and there's a lot of beliefs in society that are entrenched in thinking that punishment and imprisoning people and coming down with violence, comply or die, is an effective measure and a way to help a society. But all of science empirically denies this and, and states without question that violence does nothing but harm a society. And the founding fathers of this country were extremely uh, uh, adamant about this, and they didn't believe these things that a lot of people want to talk about. For instance, I'm going to go over a couple of them real quick, if you guys don't mind. But so Thomas Jefferson was huge on accusations made in private and confidential informants not being used in, in court cases because it sows the seeds of treachery. Yet we use confidential informants like it's crazy. We use immunity and we use um, uh, not, what's the, pardons and stuff like that uh, to to go ahead and change what the law is. We have allowed which which the founding fathers were against. We have allowed judges to interpret laws. So now everything is all crazy, and we've all decided that we that what is legal is what is right, and we have to constantly remind everybody that everything Nazi soldiers did were completely legal. We, it's not about defending your position and your brothers. It's about lifting up your society. Did you just compare police to Nazis? Why did you become a cop in the first place? What was your, what was your purpose? Yeah, so again, most of my conversations are totally – 
limit it to me spending about 90% of my time saying, I did not say that. Please don't okay, make me well, defend you, a position I didn't same say. Sentence. In fairness, Dominic, I, I, I did not get that from that comment at all, that he was comparing police to Nazis. Uh, okay. The, the, Rayford, did, did, you get, did you get that? <laughs> I'm sorry for using it in the same version. No, the no you know, and um, the three of us here, we do. And I love how as Dominic was talking about how he, he looks at a, a video of, of a police officer, you know, beating a black woman in a convenience store and 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 uh, and how that that, you know, that that uh, he gets got pushback for pointing this out. And, oh, you're hurting law enforcement for pointing this out. And, and he says, no, it's that officer beating the woman. And and so, you know, that that's one of my main reasons for speaking out. And I think Michael, you know, Michael as well is uh, and, and we, why you have us, you know, on, on this uh, on the show, John, is uh, we want to speak at things that, that that law enforcement does that is actually harmful and counterproductive. Why? Well, it's harmful and counterproductive. It doesn't work. It it breeds enmity within communities. Uh, it's you know, I, and, and I, I personally, I would say you know, it's kind of morally inconsistent. And and so you know, we have a duty to speak out, and even a higher duty as you know, as former police officers and people who 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 continue to speak out and want to serve our communities um you know by by pointing this out it does it people uh within law enforcement uh you know it it does it does hurt their ego like michael said so have you had people um give you negative feedback or or attack you you, know very very little um I, I remember when I first joined uh, Leap, uh, when it was Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. I I, I, I signed up uh, with a like a fake email. You know, I was kind of worried, uh, and but you know when I first spoke out, like with you guys at Lions, Lions of Liberty and everything, uh, you know I've ha- had had a, a, a very good uh, feedback, and um, and and very little um, very little negative negative issues. I think a lot of people are are, are kind of happy that. That others are, are kind of challenging things. A lot of officers, e- even though they they don't quite know, every police officer, particularly with drug enforcement, every single one of them will tell you what we're doing is not working. And so, a great majority are happy that that uh, that people uh, like myself and and Dominic and Michael will will speak out and, and at least uh, challenge the the status quo to to do something better. You know, uh, it, it reminded me with uh, with you guys talking about you know exposing police brutality, exposing police be- beating up a defenseless woman. Are are today's cops, and maybe this is too broad of a, a question, but I'll ask it anyway. Are, are today's cops in general in favor of body cameras, or are they against having having themselves recorded doing their job? No, we are. And anyone we're very pro. And our, our our department, our department is in a lawsuit right now with body cameras, and we still prefer them. So that that was our experience. You'll put us on a camera. I would personally, I prefer, and I think it's one of the beautiful things about what Facebook Live is doing. I think Facebook Live is going to set a trend with the next you know five to ten years where you're going to see constant live stream with your law enforcement. I honestly think that would alleviate a lot of problems because you're only taking out certain segments right now when the officer's pushing the body camera on or off. I think if you can uh, if you can run that thing twenty four seven, and you know what you eliminate some of the human factor, uh, you know what I think it'll actually be much better. Absolutely, yeah. More transparency is is always a good thing. For sure. <laughs> oh my God! Come on, come on, guys! I would go against that so heartedly. I think uh, body cameras are a tool, and it requires who's in charge of them is what matters. Uh, we see our body cameras being used to continue the Orwellian escalation of mass surveillance. You're going to end as long as police are in the control of that body camera. You are going to end up with facial recognition as officers walk past you and run you through a warrant check. Body cameras are fucking dangerous but how do you want how do you want your law enforcement to be it sounds like your your general solution for law enforcement is just to disband police and let people do whatever they want yeah so again i didn't say that Um, that's that's what i'm gathering from your arguments because you're saying that you got cops who are just doing their job just like the nazis i said body cameras were dangerous that doesn't have anything to do with example you can you can calm down i don't mean upset you (laughs) the question is is if you got a tool that is going to protect both parties in a lawful circumstance, in a, in a legal encounter, why, why would you not want that fully transparent so that you can hold police more accountable because you're, you're very much anti-police brutality or anti-criminal police behavior? 
Now you have a tool which keeps cops on their toes and on the level 20. I, I understand what a body camera is, man. Stop talking. Cool. Let me answer. Okay. okay. I'm sorry for taking it so personal, Michael. Okay. So the reason is, is because it becomes a tool and who is in control of it, it becomes their weapon. It does not provide an objective bias. A great example of this is there's a case of sheriff's deputies in Florida who had arrested a man that was on body camera and everything went fine. He, complete, he, he said that there was police brutality. The body cameras do not look like police brutality and everything was closed. But then a, car, a camera from back on a building was revealed and it was obvious that it was complete police brutality. They had no reason to be stopping him. It does matter who is in control of it. And you keep saying legal, like legal means moral or beneficial. And that is an extremely you, dangerous... You have yet to provide in this entire conversation, going back to your symptoms and cause analogy, you have yet to provide a single solution for anything that you have brought up, be it drugs, be it policing, be it body cameras, nothing. You have, you have talked about problems. You have yet to offer a solution. What's your solution? I, I literally have an entire solution model called civilian-led policing. You just can't tell be you, it's probably. It's oh my God, Dominic! Let, it's Dom, Dominic, Dominic, let, let Michael, let Michael Please, talk. You asked him a question. Hang yourself out on this one. Go ahead. Okay, I literally have an entire framework of how you do a police department called civilian-led policing. Now, I will not be able to explain that to you in a few snippets, just like I cannot give you a PhD and what I've learned from it in a few phone call seconds. You will actually have to learn something yourself, believe it or not. So I have given uh, you a solution me, a to the drug war. The drug war, again, we know that if we stop the drug war, we would be in a better situation. <laughs> Literally stopping it is better. So there is a better solution for you. Stop being violent to people that are in the, the commission of consensual adult agreements. Stop raiding people's houses and throwing flashbangs in there. Those things ruin police legitimacy, and our entire effectiveness depends on police legitimacy. Please read scientific literature. It's everywhere. Yeah, Michael, I, I, I have to ask, were you ever a patrol officer? Dude, come on, man. I was I'm a police a commander. Question. Yes, and I was, the, I was a shift commander in the Eastern District, and I was commanding 45 operational officers who went through and did their lives. I was a major case narcotics detective. I locked up over 400 people on serious cases, federal witnesses. I've done everything in policing, and I have the education to do it. You're not going to be able to put some check and balance requirement on to me. Please debate no, no, the no, merits I'm, of the calm ideas. Yourself. Well, you're, you're getting very emotional. I'm asking Please you stop question. telling me to calm myself. I'm well, a grown adult talking on the phone. Obviously. You're not under threat. You don't need your gun right now, buddy. No, you're actually you're, you're getting personal, and I just want to make sure that you're in a safe space right now. <laughs> My question is, you, you, well, you proposed you proposed to, to to take the superintendent position in Chicago. You know, I, I read about that. My question is, is you're talking about millions and millions and millions of people. You are trying to fit in your model of what you believe is a utopian society of peace and love and trees and and grass hugging. How do you how do never you propose that? that I never said that. So abolition has to be a goal. So when you say you think for abolition of policing is a goal, yes, because policing is the violent enforcement of a tyrannical government. You should want that to end, too. Will we ever achieve that end? No, that's incredibly unlikely. But you maintain goals that improve society. Your goal is literally the Orwellian escalation of a tyrannical government. Do you, do you believe that the only way to stop violence is through superior, superior violence? No, violence is a biological action of a human being. It is a malfunction of a carbon-based life form body. No amount of violence will ever reduce violence. It is proven empirically time and time again through all of human history. To propose otherwise is complete and astounding ignorance. So, so if I come up and I punch you in the face because I want your wallet, that's a violent act, right? Yeah, that's and you not, did that's that. Not me, that's not me doing that. So how would you stop me from doing that? No, that's the thing is you can't stop that. You have to prevent the things that lead to someone doing that action. You cannot okay. be some superhero that comes in and rescues everybody. That is, I mean, every libertarian principle should know. I, I you guess. call the police. They're not. Dude, let me talk. When you're, you, you're making all no the sense. You're actually, I, 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 it's, it's embarrassing to let you talk because you are talking about 
going back and giving psychological evaluations to every human being on the planet to prevent their mom dad drug issues uh, got fired from work. He's, he's Again, I didn't say that. He hasn't, he hasn't <laughs> said that. My, he hasn't said question. that. Dominic. Yes, it is, because here's the deal. I said if I walked up to you on the street, you have no idea who I am. I, I need five bucks. You got a wallet, and I punch you in the face to take your wallet. You said you can't stop me. Explain to me how you stop violence. Dude, you can walk around with your gun every single day, and if I, I, I can tell you I'm going to come take it from you. You can't be on guard 24-7. You cannot stop it. You must prevent it. It and preventions of biological issues lie in biological solutions, not in your barbaric violence. You fucking ape. Okay, who's getting who's getting personal now? This is when, this is all right, when you guys. Start all right, let's let's, let's 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 Michael. It's a let's, good thing. Okay, it's a good that's... thing you're out of law enforcement because you hurt the field. All right, let's uh, let's John, stop it's here because we're fucking apes. I mean that literally. Please no, I'm understand. Sorry. I'm, I'm Christian. I'm actually oh. Christian, and I believe that we're not apes. So that's my viewpoint. All right, my bad. Then I'm not going to be able to get you into a fact-based world. No, you won't because you know I have a fact-based belief on uh, what uh, my my core values are in life. You know, it, it's a shame. It's a shame, and your theory is great. Theory is great. You know, I I, I taught, I studied, I, I did martial arts for years, and there's a difference between theory and application. And every fighter knows it. I trained in a martial art where we did these specific moves, we did these great uh, demonstrations, all this stuff. But everybody knows that when you train one way, you're never going to apply it uh, in, in, in action the way it is. And that's the same thing, no matter how much you theorize. no matter how That literally much defies you everything know, we know about muscle memory. No matter like, how again, you're books, completely anti-science. No matter, no matter how many books you write, it doesn't matter. What you train for will be applied based on one factor, which is human experience, human dynamic, human perception. You cannot control any of that. You can go on a like, firing police range. Police aren't all even day trained long. that way. All right. You can go. Police aren't even trained that way. Range. You can go on a firing range all day long, and you can qualify for your pistol, and you can you can do muscle memory over and over and over again. It's going to boil down to the cop under fire. God forbid what they're going through that day, their perception, their adrenaline dump, their field of vision, the the, the nighttime, daytime. Are they scared shitless? Are they ready for this? You cannot control human condition. Well, guys, I think we're not going to agree here, and we have we've been talking for almost uh, ninety minutes now, and it's been, I think it's been a good conversation. It's, like it's been hopefully it's been entertaining for our listeners. Hopefully that they've uh, taken something away from this. But but before we uh, before we go here, I just want to give each of you a chance, just a you know a closing statement. Say what you want to, and then uh, plug anything you're working on. Let's start with Rayford. Yeah, well, let me just just finish off. Uh, you know, I do think we are, you know, kind of fundamental, you know, morally based human beings, and and so everyone, and that that includes, uh, you know, police officers especially, that that you should ask yourself, when is it okay to use force against another person, and and that's the very first question you should ask yourself. Uh, you know, if if you can't, if you wouldn't. If it wouldn't be correct to use force as, as a citizen against another person, then it wouldn't be right to use force as a police officer in that situation. And as far as improving police uh, police officers, I know they want to help and make a difference. Um, and um, Dominic, you were saying, well, you know, what are the solutions? And I would start with – what police officers are doing that are that are harmful, and I've used the word counterproductive a lot, counterproductive, and like what we focused on in this issue, the drug war. How, what What is your solution? Well, look at things you can stop doing that would actually improve the situation, and that would be the first one is get out of the drug business. Um, yeah, you can find me. I'm on Twitter at Rayford D, and uh, have a blog post at Blue Enmity. Uh, BlueEnmity.com, a uh, uh, block spot, excuse me. All right, Michael. Oh, thanks for having us. Um, the only thing I'll say is most of this is kind of coming down to the nuances of the philosophical arguments underpinning where I am coming from. And I have written a book on that that I just released out. It's called Crimes and Punishments in the 21st Century. And that will lay down all these things. You can get that from Amazon right now. 
and go through to see these philosophical underpinnings of what I'm talking about and why these things have to be this way because of the society we're in and what we've learned through science. Um, you can follow me or just what my website would be the easiest thing, michaelawoodjr.net, and I try to reach out as much as I can and I'll speak and do whatever uh, that's possible. Thanks. All right. And I've gonna... said this before a million times. This is the greatest time in the history of law enforcement to be a cop because it offers you an opportunity to do things the right way. As much as I love engagements like this, there's there's the concept of no matter how many books I write or how much of an expert I believe that I am in relationships and theories and what I believe will get will lead me to a healthy marriage. It's there. There's another person involved in it. If my wife does not want to stay with me, she's not going to stay with me. Policing is a relationship. You have the police and the public, and no matter how much you want to say things should be done one way, you still have to have the public's willing participation to go the way you think it should go. Anybody can reach me at iso.us. Everything is listed there. All right. Fantastic, guys. This has been a, uh, a fun conversation. I want to thank each of you for coming on. I respect each of you. And uh, hopefully we can do this again sometime, maybe uh, for episode 200. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, John. I appreciate you having us on. I yeah, appreciate you guys and have a great night. Be safe. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that episode today. Uh, that was that was incredible. Um, it was hopefully entertaining for you guys. It did get a little bit contentious at times, and I tried to tried to keep everything as civil as I could. I did expect, obviously, some disagreements to a certain extent. I I knew these guys came in and. Uh, were very strong-minded, and I knew they had different opinions. But I also knew that I had three former cops who all realized that the system, the current system is broken, the current system is corrupt, and I got all of them to agree, at the very least, that the drug war should be significantly reduced to the extent that marijuana should be legalized fully across the board which is which is huge when you really think about it, where these three guys are coming from and each of their ideological viewpoints. You have, on the one hand, Dominic Izzo, who described himself in the beginning as a conservative libertarian. Um, I don't know if I would agree with the libertarian part to a certain extent. I, I think uh, he's definitely a conservative. Um, I, I think he believes that cops still serve a role in in pre-crime, in preventing crime by arresting people. And he got in talking, talking about that with still utilizing the war on drugs to regulate heroin. You have a guy like Michael Wood Jr., who he didn't agree with me saying it, but I'll say it. I think he comes at it more from a progressive perspective, but obviously very much understands that the current system of policing is broken. And at times, he sounded like an anarchist. At other times, he didn't sound like an anarchist, but uh, definitely came at it from a, a very different viewpoint than Dominic did. And they argued quite a bit um, about, uh, about that philosophy uh, back and forth. And um, unfortunately, it, it did get a little bit personal at times. So it is what it is. And then Rayford, Rayford Davis, of course, Rayford. I'll admit it. I'm a libertarian. Rayford is a libertarian. He, in the beginning, he said he was an anarchist. So Rayford and I definitely align the most. I agree pretty much with almost everything that Rayford said. Um, now, one thing I will say, I did not chime in. I did not interrupt. I did not make my viewpoint known on every single topic that we talked about today. And the reason for that is I had three people on the show, and I wanted to give each of them enough time to talk. I didn't want to, their time is valuable and I wanted to make sure that they had time to talk. <clears throat> they, they were sitting there waiting while each one of them gave their opinions on each topic. So I didn't want to, you know, chime in too much and take up too much time. I will say if you're new to the show and you haven't heard felony Friday before, obviously I am for ending the war on drugs. Uh, my slogan here on felony Friday is no victim, no crime, no time. We actually sell a t-shirt where it says that on it, you can you can buy a T-shirt that says "No Victim, No Crime, No Time" at lionsofliberty dot store, and if if you want to hear some great interviews with felons who have interviewed, who have told their story, who are a lot of these people are actually victims of the war on drugs. They spent many years in prison, 
And so many of them have come out, they have positive attitude, and they have very, very successful lives today, but they've shared their journey on podcasts, on previous podcasts of Felony Friday. And you can find just those podcasts, just those interviews with felons at lionsofliberty.com slash felons to find the full archive for every episode of Felony Friday. This is episode 100, so all 100 episodes, you can go to felonyfriday.com and that'll route you right to the archive and you can find whatever episode you're looking for. Or, of course, um, you can go to iTunes. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, and a bunch of other podcasting apps, pretty much any podcasting app out there. And if you just want to find a Felony Friday episode, just search. If you search Felony Friday, I'll bring it up. If you want to find a, you know, a guest like Michael Wood or, or Dominic Izzo or Rafer's previous appearances on the show, I encourage you to search for them as well. I would also link to all of their previous appearances on Felony Friday as, as well as on Mark's show on the OG Lines of Liberty podcast. I will link to that on the show notes page. Of course, I'll link to uh, the link to all my interviews with former felons in the Felony Friday archive as well. And lastly, I will say, if you wonder where I stand on gun rights, if you wonder where I stand on the Second Amendment, uh, I'll link to episode number 92 on the show notes page. And the title of that episode is Make Automatic Weapons Legal. So that title pretty much says it all right there. But I, I really uh, enjoyed recording that episode, and I, I left it all out there. I recorded that right after uh, what happened in Las Vegas. And the reason why is I, I was fed up fed up with uh, a lot of libertarians, I think, coming out with a wishy-washy response to that, um, talking about you know not, not really standing on principle, which I thought Rayford did a very good job today standing on principle when I asked him that question. So guys, one more thing, one more favor to ask. And if you're new to this show, and you might be, we are doing some advertising on Dave Smith's Part of the Problem podcast. So no pressure. If you're first, if you're first time listening to the show, go listen to some more shows. You can, you can ignore this part right here. But if you've been listening for a while and you want more content outside of our three shows per week that we have, we also have exclusive content for our Lions Pride we have several reoccurring um, themed episodes. We have a conspiracy theory roundtable. We have a degenerate gamblers roundtable where we talk about uh, hypothetical betting on games. And we just have extra episodes left and right all the time. We have extra questions with some guests that we bring on. I'll be releasing a uh, little extra session I did with Larry Levine. That was episode number 99. If you haven't heard my interview with Larry Levine, go check it out right now. I'll link to that on the show notes page as well. You can join the pride for as little as $5 per month. The top level or actually the top level is now a hundred dollars per month. And that actually gets you some advertising as well on the podcast. But below that, the next level down is $25 per month. And that, that level, my friends gets you access to a monthly conference call with us where you can actually influence the show. You also get a bunch of freebies Below that, you have the $10 level. You don't get the conference call, but you get a bunch of freebies. So, guys, we just want you to join. Go to lionsofliberty.com slash support to learn more. Um, we're ramping up this podcast. We're starting to advertise, and we are on the way up. We're a rocket ship, baby. So come join us. That is all I got for the show today, guys. Thank you so much for listening. This is John Odermatt signing off. Always remember to keep your head up and the fires of liberty burning. Liberty burning.